what I want to talk today about today is graphics. And um, maybe that's, that's a good topic after lunch, uh, something fun. Um, I also want to thank uh, Naresh, who just ran away, uh, very much for inviting me to this great conference. But um, let's talk about graphics. So actually, when it comes to graphics, animations, game engines, this sort of thing, um, functional programming languages really got a problem. I mean, most functional programming languages at least, and definitely Haskell. So the problem is that on one hand, they are state-of-the-art um, systems, libraries, frameworks, uh, which look great, have a lot of features, but they're typically implementing languages like C++. They're very imperative, working on some mutable uh, object graph. And here, this example is uh, from SpriteKit with some Objective-C code. So great output, but uh, maybe not the best programming experience. Well, you could bind to that just using functional interface from Haskell, then you get the same great output, but you're writing kind of very imperative, low-level code in um, Haskell. So we don't win that much. Or you take one of the graphical systems built up just right from scratch in Haskell, nice and pure. On the visual side, maybe not that great. But it's a nice, purely functional data structure you do all your stuff on. So <clears throat> maybe also not the optimal solution. So can we have both? Can we take a state-of-the-art framework and somehow, instead of just writing imperative code in Haskell, make it such that we can have really nice functional code and, and use that state-of-the-art library underneath. So in a way that this library, which is kind of the wrapper, the, the, the in intermediary, kind of takes these operations on the purely functional structure and somehow transcribes them to state manipulations on the object graph. So what I want to do today, I want in three parts, I want to tell you a story of how to do that. So first of all, we are going to look at what's the state of the art. How do these libraries work? How do we use them, the good ones, the ones which look nice? And then what's the kind of Haskell API, a nice, pure, func purely functional API that we would like to use with them? And then the tricky bit, how do we get the two together? Okay, that's the plan. And because um, <clears throat> to make it fun and concrete, um, I'm going to talk about how I've done this in the context um, of Apple's SpriteKit uh, 2D game engine using a, a little sample game as a running sample, which I'm sure you've seen before. And um, nevertheless, the, the, the concepts, what I'm going to talk about, I mean, this could apply equally well to other um, graphic libraries as well. And I, I invite you to kind of write a binding to, you, to your favorite one. It's just when it goes to these kind of high-end graphic things, then typically you have to pick something platform-specific. So, um, okay, let's try, try, try right into it and let's look at um, what we want from the visual, from the um, um, game engine side and, and how that looks like. So, um, this example program I um, told you about, so the running example, just so you, there, there are some components, there are these pipes moving, there's a background, there's some physics which handles collisions, stuff like that. So we want to cover all this, right? We want all that. And um, so how is this represented? A scene like that, a game scene like that, is typically represented in a hierarchical manner. So we have the scene itself, and then in a, in a tree um, arrangement, we have all the different components of the scene. And then there are visual things like the sprites, but there are also components like the dotted boxes here, which are just, they have no visuals, but they group together other parts to provide structure. And then there are some nodes in that tree which attached to them, we have um, actions uh, to implement things like animations, moving something uh, over a period of time from A to B, stuff like that. 
And then finally, some of those nodes we can associate with what's called a physics body. And that's um, all the objects with physics bodies, they will be um, uh, used by the physics engine to calculate the physics of the game. And they will be influenced by the physics. So that's the different bits and pieces we have, have to worry about. Now, actually it's not really a tree, it's just a tree. Actually, uh, these scene descriptions are graphs because of the back edges. But for the remainder of the talk, I, I will ignore that complication. All right, but because all this is based on object-oriented framework, of course all the different nodes in that graph, in that tree, they're all different classes of SpriteKit. And, um, well, it's object orientation, so mm, we have inheritance and the class hierarchy. Doesn't sound very Haskell-y at this point, right? We, somehow we have to do some impedance matching here. And the way it's organized in, in SpriteKit is there's this um, abstract class called SK node, which is um, providing some properties and some methods. Um, here I'm using Swift code instead of Objective-C to make it a little bit more readable. Um, and those properties and, and methods, they inherit by all the other classes because they're needed for any kind of um, game object. Or, or graphics object here. And then we have the various classes for different types of sprites and shapes and lights and whatever there is in those graphical scenes. And, and then finally, there, there's a, a, a strange one. The overall scene is actually a subclass of one of these and it does make a lot of sense. I think that's bad design in that library, but nevertheless, if we want to represent this stuff in Haskell, we somehow have to deal with it. And we can't ignore it because what you have to do in SpriteKit, the class which you write your overall game in has to be a subclass of that scene class because you need some game specific state. You need state which is specific to the type of game you're implementing or animation you're implementing. And that's not all. There's also in that class hierarchy above SK node is another one which is called NS responder, which is a cocoa thing and it's about getting events. All the input key presses, mouse movements, all the stuff we, we react to, um, we have to get at by, having, by overriding these methods in those, that subclass. Now that sounds bad. Now do I have to write Haskell class with subclasses and Objective-C or Swift class in order to get at input? That wouldn't be a very nice Haskell program, I guess. So we'll have to come with, up with some better way of doing that. So this is the first problem, the first OO imperative versus functional mismatch. Now what about the second one? Well, it's a mutable object graph. So let's look at, at a specific part of, of that particular game. So if you look at the bird, you'll see that depending on whether it falls or goes up, it changes its tilt, right? So how, how is that achieved? Well, in, in Objective-C or Swift, the SK node class has a, a property called set rotation. And the way we can implement that is that depending on the vertical velocity, we change the set rotation. And then the graphics library will take care of the rest. Uh, but, uh, well, if you look at this overall scene graph, then there's this sprite in here in the graph, and there's a property on that one object and I have to mutate it in place. <laughs> Who here is programming Haskell? Does that send shivers down your spine? Everybody else, it should send shivers down your spine too. But, but where does the code come from which does perform that mutation? Um, well, there on the scene class, there's actually a method called update. And that update function is called by the framework once per frame. So 60 times a second, this update function is called. And that update function, because it has the scene uh, as its class, via self can access the entire scene graph. It can change whatever it wants. It's called object-oriented programming, right? 
And so it just mutates stuff. I mean, if you paid attention to the keynote this morning, uh, shared mutable data structures and probably it's also going to be multi-threaded, no fun. Okay, so we'll have to come up with something better. But it's going to get worse because look at this. I mean, there are these pipes and they, new pipes created, old ones flying out. So the scene changes over time. So how is that implemented in SpriteKit? Well, that SK node class also has a few methods to manipulate that object graph. You can't just change the references because then the graph structure would break. So you have to do everything via those provided methods. Um, and for example, there's one to add a new child to a node. So when these pair of pipes come into the scene, this method has to be called on some subtree which represents both pipes. All right. So, <clears throat> so what that means is in the overall object graph, this pipe pair is kind of, there's one node which has all the pipes underneath it. And then the update function is called and it decides, well, we need a new one and sticks it into the graph uh, and another one. And then at some point, one of them will move off the screen, has to be dropped. Okay, so we are kind of in place mutating the graph while the whole thing runs. That sounds even worse. So we have three problems. Number one, somehow we have to handle this class hierarchy and this stuff in this base class and so on, event handlers. Then we have mutating properties which affect visuals. And then we have graph edits happening while everything animates. So, uh, so let's look at what we want. This is, that's how the existing libraries work. But let's look at what would we want if we could just have a wish, our wish API. And we, we'll keep it simple. I mean, there'll be Haskell code, it'll all be very simple. We won't use any complicated, like, state transformer, higher order, G, A, all this stuff. You don't have to know about it. We we'll just use pure functions, simple algebraic data types, that's it. Whatever functional language you use, these things you have in every single functional language. Okay? So, in one way or another. Um, so, how do we handle this subclassing? Well, specifically in Haskell, the way we are going to do it is let's look at this class hierarchy again. So, I said this SK scene class, that's a bit strange and this is wrong anyway. So, let's just strike that. We'll, we'll find a solution but let's look at the rest. So now we've got this base class and then we've got all these different types of visuals. And that's really alternatives. So it screams some type. Okay, so in Haskell what we're going to do, we define an algebraic data type saying, well, a node is either a plain node, no visuals, or a label, or a sprite, or a shape, or whatever, right? And then remember, that base class that introduced some properties and methods which I use on all of them. And so this is a little bit Haskell specific. Now in Haskell, if you use record syntax to specify algebraic data types, you can have some uh, fields which occur in all of them or a subset. And um, so what we are going to do, all the stuff which is in the SK node class, this is going to be in every single alternative. You can use it uniformly, regardless of which var variant we've got. And then each, except node, all the other alternatives, they have some specific fields which are specific to that particular visual. So for example, the label, uh, label variant has a text, which is label text. Uh, the sprite variant has the texture for the sprite, and so on. So um, th that's our representation. Nice, simple algebraic data type. So how about scenes? Well, since is another data type, and that data type has uh, a set of children, so square brackets in Haskell's lists. So it's a list of nodes as children on the scene, and then other information like background color and so on. And the, the, the last thing to note is, is up here. These are parameters to that data type, so it's a parameterized data type, and those type parameters 
whenever we use a particular scene for a particular application, we instantiate them to a type which contains all the state which is particular to that game or whatever we are implementing. Right? So we have one for, C, for the scene, and then the nodes can have some other local information. And um, so basically, all this kind of subclassing business we resolve by using um, parametric polymorphism. That's much nicer. Well, at least for a real function programmer, it's much nicer. All right. So, um, <clears throat> so let's, let's do that. Let's see what happens. So um, in this program, um, oops, what's happening here? So we, um, we've got some state for the nodes. That's quite simple in these applications. Usually we don't have any specific state. Only for the pipes, we maintain some random numbers in order to have them different heights. And then um, for the overall scene, um, we've got different states. The game can be in, can be running, or the bird can be crashing into something, or game can be over. And um, then there are some other fields like was a key pressed, what's the current score, all this kind of information goes into the scene state. And then we instantiate uh, our data. Uh, this, this is type synonym in Haskell, right? Like, and um, we have a type synonym which instantiates the scene data type with those types we define specifically for this game. And um, <coughs> then we um, define the bird. That's important as, as a sprite. So that's a sprite node. And it's got a name. It's got a starting position. And we can attach actions to nodes. It's one of the things I said in the beginning. So the action we attach to the bird is cycling through a set of textures in order to get the flapping of the wings. Right? Uh, so that action is running forever during the whole game. And then um, we put all this into uh, an overall scene, which has a particular size, the background color, and as its only component for now, the bird. And um, if, we, if we run this, then it uh, looks like that. Bird flies in the sky. All right, so that's a good start. So OK, let's look at actually putting some movement on the screen. OK, so we have to mutate stuff. Um, so I said in the Objective-C side, there's a field in the SK node class, which is the set rotation of a sprite, or any visual. And well, this is algebraic data type. This is immutable. We can't just change it. We can make a new version with a different value, but we can't change it. We can't update it. No side effects. So we account for that by changing the type of the update what was the update method into a function, which I call scene update function, and it's defined as a pure, pure functional type. So what does that mean? It means it gets a scene as its first argument. If you're not used to reading Haskell code, Haskell has this weird thing called currying, where if you have a binary function, you put arrows between the function arguments as well, no brackets. So this is a binary function, gets a scene, gets how much time passed since the last time update was called, and returns a new scene. OK? But that's just a pure transformer. No side effects. Gets a scene, returns a new scene, purely functional. All right? So we can just return a new scene where the rotation has been changed. And events, we handle the same way. We have a, a, a callback handler function, and then a pure function which gets an event description, gets the current scene information of the game and produces a new one. For example, with the score changed or whatever. And um, now, if we put that into action in our example, then that's the current situation. So there's gravity already. We want the bird to go up. So we add some code. And um, in particular, we add an event handler. The event handler inspects the current event it got. If it's a key press, well, then change the state. It returns a new state. It doesn't mutate it, where the key pressed flag is set. And then um, <coughs> in the update function, our update function, we pattern match. You don't have to read. This is just weird, has the pattern matching. It means I take the scene state, and I look at 
is key press true, yes or no? If it's true, well, then I call this function, which adds an impulse upwards velocity to the bird, which I won't show you. Uh, if there's no key pressed, I call this other function, which computes the tilt of the bird, which I will show you. Now, that function is, again, a pure function. It gets the sprite node as its first argument. It does some pattern matching on that to extract the physics body. Why the physics body? Because the physics body includes the velocity of the sprite. And then it does some math to compute a new tilt, a new angle from the current vertical velocity. And then it doesn't in place modify anything. It returns a new node with a new tilt. Okay? So all pure transformation functions. And if we um, let that run, then we see we get the event handling and we get the tilting. All right. <coughs> so how about graph edits? That was our th third problem. Well, actually, same deal. There's no change from a functional program perspective. All these, the scene and all the various nodes, they have children fields, which are just lists of other nodes. And by changing those lists, by adding something to a list like that, you get a new uh, element in the scene. So for example, um, in order to implement the pipes. So we are here with the whole game, but no pipes yet. So how do we add the pipes? Well, we extend the update function. So by adding new, new node into the graph, which has an action, a custom action. What does this custom action do? Well, it spawns a pipe pair, then it waits 1.5 second, seconds, and then it repeats this forever. So every 1.5 seconds, we get new pipes. And this custom action, well, that gets the pipe, the parent pipe um, node. And what it does, it takes its children and colon is list uh, consing in Haskell. It puts one new element into that list of children. And that new element is a new subtree with that new pair of pipes. And that's it. So again, we take a node and we return a new node, which is suitably different. So if we look at um, what that looks like when we run it again, then suddenly we've got these pipes appearing. Okay. All right. So too easy. It's a bit too easy, isn't it? It's like I've got all this mess here, and then I make a wish. I get my nice interface and done. So I don't know, if, if, you, if you watch a movie, like a fantasy movie or so, and there's some magic in it, usually whenever you use magic, or the protagonists in that movie use magic, they have to pay a price, a horrible price, right? Well, this is magic, so how about payment? Well, let's look at this in detail. So this is the, the scene graph. Now, what do I have to do to implement this update function? Well, I have to take this whole Objective-C structure. I have to make a Haskell data structure out of it using this algebraic data type. Then I apply my Haskell function. I get a new version of that Haskell data structure. I have to take the whole data structure and convert it into a scene graph again, only to get one new subtree. What about the old pipes? and all the rest of the tree. Are we going to really copy all this from Objective-C land into Haskell land and then back again? Does that sound like a good plan, something you want to do 60 times a second to get a smooth animation? Actually, it's worse. It's worse because I said these nodes, they can have animation actions and stuff attached to it. Like if I have an animation action which moves something from here to there, over, say, a second, then, I mean, the framework has to store that information about where is the animation, how far, the, all this information has to be stored somewhere, right? And I told you it's implemented in C++, in Objective-C API. How do you think these people have implemented? They have just some pointer to some hidden state nobody can get at, and it's all mutated in place. That's, of course, how it's done. So if I take this 
the, from the public API, the information about the data structure, convert it into Haskell and back again, I get something which looks the same but loses all that internal state. All the animations are going to start from scratch. It's going to be a huge mess. So what I call eager marshalling, taking the whole scene graph, marshalling over, is, this is a good kind of like, this is how it works in principle, but we can't implement it like that, okay? So with this hidden state, it's impossible and would be way too inefficient anyway. So now we need, need a good idea. So what's our good idea? We've got this graph here. This is our Haskell data structure as seen, and that update function is a pure function. So I don't marshal the whole thing. I do something which I call lazy marshalling. I'll explain it in a second. To, to get a scene representation Haskell, then I apply the Haskell function to get a new scene representation, and then more magic, I have two scene values which I compare and compute the difference. And then only that difference is applied to the scene graph. Okay? We don't make a new scene graph. We figure out what changed and change the old thing in place. But this is all done in the library. The user doesn't have to know, the Haskell user doesn't have to know anything about that. But how do we do that? We pay three times in worse and worse amount. So how, how does lazy marshalling work? The idea in lazy marshalling is I take the root of the tree, I make a Haskell representation for that. That's my record of the various uh, fields. Now, I don't marshal the rest. Instead, what I put in here is what Haskell programmers call a thunk. You all, I assume, know Haskell is a lazy language. Things are only evaluated if they need to be evaluated. So there's a way to represent at runtime a computation which we know how to do, but we don't do it yet. This is called a thunk. So we put thunks in here. And thunks have pointers to the other parts of the graph structures which they can use to marshal the rest if ever needed, if we really traverse the whole scene or whatever path we traverse, on-demand marshal. And the same with the other bits and pieces in the stru structure. So how can we implement that in Haskell? If you believe in purely functional programming, I think now is the time to close your eyes. Don't tell your kids about it. Um, so what we are going to do, so there are two things. Here we're creating these thunks using something which is called unsafe performer IO. So unsafe, all functions in the Haskell library which are called unsafe, is basically don't use them. That's not quite true. What does unsafe mean? Unsafe doesn't mean my program is going to crash. Unsafe means the Haskell compiler doesn't know whether what you're doing is okay or not. So you, the programmer has to decide. You have additional obligations of reasoning here to make sure this, okay, this is all okay, I assure you. <coughs> and then there's something other weird, like, what's that? So I've written uh, a library to uh, using something we call template Haskell, which is the Haskell meta programming system, to have inline objective C code in Haskell. So you can have a Haskell program with inline objective C and that's called from inside the program. Um, if you're interested in that, how that works, I've given a talk about that at the Haskell Symposium a few years back. Uh, it's on YouTube, you can look that up. Um, so I'm calling inline objective C code to do the marshalling um, using this unsafe perform IO, which is suspended into a thunk and only really executed if you need it. That's number one. So now we've done this. We've got our lazily marshaled structure. And now we, um, <coughs> we uh, apply the Haskell scene update function. And um, now the U in this particular function implementation, only one thing changed. The name of the scene, wa scene was changed for whatever reason. Everything else stayed the same. So now my library has to figure that out. It has to check what changed. And then notice by the comparison, only that name changed. So I only update that name in place in the Objective C representation. Nothing else is touched. So how can we do that? 
keep in mind, these things here are thunks. If we evaluate them, we perform the work we want, didn't want to do. Any hardcore Haskell programmers here who know the GHC runtime system really well? So there's another unsafe function. It's not just unsafe, it's really unsafe. Pointer equality. So that means, like, really don't use it. Why did they put that in the library if they don't want anybody to use it, right? That doesn't make any sense. And it's got a strange hash mark. That if, you, if you've done any Haskell, you know when you see the hash mark, you go away. This basically means internal low-level runtime system stuff. Okay. Um, so what does that do? It actually takes the pointers, I mean, says, it does what it says it does. It takes the pointers, the literal pointers into the Haskell heap and compares them. Is this the same address, yes or no? Well, we had thunks in this uh, record, right? A thunk in a represent heap representation is a pointer to whatever the internal representation. We take that pointer. If that pointer didn't change, it's still the same thunk. Because if that thunk gets evaluated, laziness doesn't just mean only evaluate it if needed. It means the second thing. It means if you need it twice, you're still only allowed to evaluate it once. That's the difference between laziness and non-strictness, in case you were wondering. So what happens in the runtime implementation is when a thunk is evaluated, it gets updated, overwritten by compiler-generated code with the thing it evaluated to, meaning the address is different. Okay, that's how we can figure out whether the update function touched that stuff. And then if it's still the same, well, we don't do anything. If it's not the same, then we have some inline objectives code, objective C code to do the update again. Okay, so now the third price we pay looks harmless in comparison, but let me assure you, it's worse. So what's that? Well, we want to make sure, remember what the goal here is, we have this scene graph, and whenever something changes on the Haskell side, we want to just update the existing objects. But to do that, on the Haskell side, we have to know what those are. So all node representations which haven't been created in Haskell, but which have been marshaled from Objective-C, they contain a pointer to the Objective-C representation. That's in this SK node type. And that pointer serves as an identity, as a name, if you like, for the thing on the Objective-C side. So if there's a change in any of those fields, then the object pointed to by this pointer is being manipulated. Sounds nice. I mean, maybe SK node harmless. So what's the problem here? Any ideas? Why is it really evil? No really unsafe something, just maybe. The problem is, what if somebody duplicates those pointers on the Haskell side? So now we have two Haskell objects representing the same Objective-C thing. They change in different well. So the library is still safe. It just if, if you do that, if you duplicate, it's only one of them is going to be taken. The other one is regarded to be as if there's nothing, making fresh objects, which may or may not be what you want, but doesn't crash your program at least. Um, but you may know that um, the company I work for, Tweak.io, is working on an extension to GLC's type system for linear types. And um, that would help here if we would indicate in the type for the update function that it has to be linear in the scene, um, then these things can only be used once. All right, so <coughs> that's it. Um, the Haskell Sprite Kit is open source on GitHub. If you want to look at all the gory Haskell code doing really unsafe stuff, and you want to show, if you're not a Haskell person, and you want to go to your Haskell colleagues and really annoy them, say, Haskell is this unsafe language, what are you talking about? Just use my library and you'll be good. 
Uh, but maybe you're a Haskell person or you want to be a Haskell person and you want to write some cool um, graphic stuff, then, well, uh, use that library as well. And um, generally, these ideas, I think, so using this lazy marshalling and uh, diffing is something, this is more general idea. You may uh, all know, probably, React, Na React and React Native, the frameworks from uh, Facebook called JavaScript. It's a similar idea there. Instead of manipulating the browser, don't directly manipulate a pure structure, and then there's some automatic translation of changes. So this is really a general approach to turning messy, imperative, uh, graph mutating stuff into purely functional API, which I think is a good thing to do. So thank you very much. Any questions, if you like? Yeah, so um, in fact, the way, so the question was, how about other languages than Objective-C? Um, in fact, so Haskell has um, a very good uh, um, foreign function interface for interfacing with C. And uh, the Objective-C interface actually goes via the C interface. And you, you can use it, people have used it for other languages as well. There are bindings to um, C++ libraries, and they also go via C interface. There are bindings to uh, Java. Um, R, other languages, so all these things can kind of see API is the lingua franca for interfacing languages in a sense. So um, that's how it's usually done in the Haskell ec ecosystem. Um, directly interfacing with C++ is much more tricky because of all the name langling, there are a lot of specific things. If you go via C, it's all fairly standardized by the architecture. Um, the, um, with respect to the inline code, there are two libraries actually which do inline C for Haskell. Um, so my Objective-C one does C because C is, Objective-C is a superset of C. There's a second one called inline C, which is also by Tweakio, um, which is similar and um, focused on C. Um, there, um, there's no library for inline C++, but it, there's no conceptual reason why there couldn't be. So I think this is, uh, again, a really interesting way of doing, a generally interesting way of integrating languages by having inline code of one language in the other. Um, I found that a lot better, nicer to work with than uh, other approaches I've tried in the past. Um, yeah, so if you go to this GitHub repository, on, in the readme there's a link to a paper uh, which describes these techniques. Mm -hmm. Pardon? Okay, and, uh, well, there's all kinds of libraries for game programming on Hackage. Hackage is the Haskell packaging system. Uh, most of them are in a state which is not really very usable. They are all very expert. Most of them try to do the, what I said, kind of do it from the ground up. And it's not that you can't write a game engine from the ground as up in Haskell or bind to something or so, but it's just a lot of work and it needs a lot of specialized expertise. So this stuff usually doesn't go very far because people do it for a few months, they lose interest to something else. This, this one you can use. Um, the, the GitHub, on GitHub there are also two samples, so this one and another sample game, small one we did with it. Um, just as a demo. Um, so that's perfectly usable. You can compile it in a standalone Mac application. Uh, nobody has to know there's an Haskell inside. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but <clears throat> that's what I'm saying is basically really in this space where there's so much domain expertise in implementing these frameworks, doing everything from scratch in your favorite language may not be the best option because it's just too much work. To, to implement something like that. Mm 